tonight we're going to be looking at narcissism, borderline, and uh, recovery from the effects of it. So recognizing the difference between borderline personality disorder and narcissism is key. Have any of you received a BPD diagnosis? Okay. So some of the things I'm going to be talking about will offer a degree of, uh, of comfort because there is a big confusion. It is changing, fortunately, but academia and psychology as an institution is slow to change, but it is going through the process of updating because it's, as it's conceptualized at the moment, it's an extremely, uh, well, it's just out of date. It's non-functional. The difference between the clockwork and the uh, internal mechanism of narcissism and borderline personality disorder is significant. The effects on you as a person are significant. That's why it's important to recognize the difference between the two things. Um, do any of you think you have been with somebody who would be classic NPD? Classic for NPD. Have any of you been with somebody who you think is classic for BPD? Any of the ladies in here think they've been with a male borderline? Okay. Um, it's much harder, well, it's not, it's not that it's harder, it's that it's outside of our culture to recognize it in men. So there is a lot of um, gender bias, even amongst psychologists, they don't say it. Because what we would see with men and how they manifest borderline personality disorder is different to the way women manifest it. For no other reason than it's a, it's a power thing. There is what you can do and what you can't do. So what men can do, being physically stronger, is they can rage externally. So we see it and we go, oh, that guy's got an anger management issue. He's drinking and getting into fights or he punched a cop or whatever it is. <laughs> Women, physically less able to do that, some do, but then the rage, if it can't be expressed externally, it becomes internalized. And then the self-harm becomes more prominent because the self-rage turns into self-loathing and bitterness and you end up with more of an internal fight. So the man will be seen as a psychopath. The male borderline will more classically be seen as a psychopath. Uh, because he appears criminal. But actually what's going on is, uh, is a little different to that. The key elements to this with borderline personality disorder, this is non-clinical, this is my opinion. It's, part, it's partly based on, on some research that I've done. And then unwittingly, I have coached a lot of people with borderline personality disorder. I attract them. I'm not a narcissist magnet. I am a borderline magnet. <laughs> probably because my closest tendencies, if I was going to be diagnosed with a personality disorder, would be BPD. So where we're seeing BPD and where it's being misdiagnosed, and it's very frequently misdiagnosed, is around the issue of emotional dysregulation. So what you need to understand when you're trying to recognize the difference between narcissistic personality disorder and BPD is the emotional dysregulation. Classically, Borderline personality disorder is right next door to PTSD. So if any of us want to understand borderline personality disorder, we have to have a better than average understanding of trauma. PTSD, not CPTSD. So if you're trying to figure out what happened in a bad relationship with an ex-wife or an ex-girlfriend, you'd have to go back and look at the literature just on PTSD. A lot of the borderline personality disorder is, is, uh, literature is tainted, unfortunately because we have our ideas pre-existing about what that means and what it doesn't mean. We're gonna to get to that in just a moment. So PTSD or shell shock or trauma or battle stress or whatever you wanna call it. When an entity is placed under pressure that they cannot deal with, under stress that they cannot deal with, the parts of the system, the parts of the personality begin to warp and fracture. So what you're dealing with is a person who is warped by trauma. They folded under terrible, terrible, terrible pressure. So straight away, we can find a route into looking at this not uh, with morality. This is an, an amoral position that we should adopt for this particular understanding that we're trying to get to. So morality has no place here. It's a systemic issue. So look at that person with cold dispassion the way that the Buddhists would traditionally talk about compassion is not warm and fuzzy. It's quite cool and it's distant and it accepts the situation as it is. We, having spent time, good evening, Mr. Hennigan. Please enter the dojo. Have a seat, mate. Can I walk across the right yeah, walk right. Can you just wave at the camera <laughs> as you go? Um, 
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Steve Hennigan. Terry's still out there. I'm sure he thinks he hasn't stopped it. Terry's on the door with uh, with our mark. Yeah, yeah, seeing that people, because we're, we're still waiting for 20 people to come. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's loads to come yet. Um, what was it saying? Sorry. <laughs> That's a pattern interrupt. <laughs> Steve doing a little dance past my eyes. This is a visual wipe. So what we've got to look at is um, ju just go back. Like, try and wipe what you've seen, what you've heard about Borderline. I know it's hard to wipe it and just think, there is a person with PTSD. Now, imagine a child trapped in an environment that they can't escape, put under huge pressure that they can't deal with. They try to find a way of surviving it. Some people say that what they will first try will be narcissism. They will try to deal with the trauma that they're going through by entering into a false sense of self that is godlike and all powerful and they're a classic narcissist and it fails. They try and they can't. The kind of abuse that they're experiencing, maybe the abuser even recognizes it on some level and crushes it. So they see that resistance and they even crush the mentally unwell resistance that the child tries to engage in, in psychological defense of itself. The reason why I'm talking about PTSD, sorry for me standing like this, it's because of my knee. It's, I know it looks, it's a bit of an affectation when people flip a chair around like they're trying to be cool. I want to stand up so I could see you, but my knee is, uh, is not so good. Um, so you have this issue where you have a person who cannot cope with the stress that they've been placed under. Now, when you're with a borderline, you will see them becoming overwhelmed regularly. That's kind of like a, this is non-clinical, um, not peer-reviewed, published. But the state of existence is, I can't cope. I can't cope. And you will receive that signal a lot. In fact, when you look at borderline personality disorder, you will be receiving a lot of signals that say, save me, save me, save me. Even when raging, even when uh, abusive, even when bullying, they're still signaling, please save me, please save me. The other element that I want to relate back to the PTSD, imagine you're a, a soldier um, and you're trapped in a situation where you can't escape and you're, I don't know, you're under sniper fire or mortar fire and you are terrified. You think you've seen other people die and you think any second it's me, any second now it's me. Under that bombardment that is literal, there's an, there's an equivalence between the psychological bombardment and childhood of the child. It breaks ego boundaries. There's only so much stress we're evolved to tolerate. We're extraordinarily adaptable creatures. Um, I think it's Brett Weinstein who says, that's our superpower as animals. It's our adaptability. We don't have teeth, we don't have claws, we're not that powerful, but we're incredibly adaptable. But it's not infinite. It's not an infinite adaptability. Hiya. Grab a seat, there's some at the front here. Don't be scared. You've got Steve next to you, he'll, pro he'll, pro he'll protect you. Um, so that adaptability becomes an adaptability that um, has to be to stress that we can't manage. Imagine you're a child and you have no ego boundaries. So I want you to think like psychoanalysts for a second, whether you like psych psychoanalytic theory or not. Go back and pretend that you can remember the time before you could even recognize faces. You know that babies don't see, they don't actually see. They can't, they can't, they haven't learned to see. They can't recognize one face from another, a tiny, tiny baby. They just see color and they see shapes and they can smell and they can hear sounds. So they're not really looking at your face and being like, oh, you've got your mum's nose, you know, I just see your eyebrows, just like they're not doing any of that. They're just looking at colors and shapes that are talking to them. So that's a very fluid, boundaryless state of impressions and impressionability. That's where we all start. In that state, we are all narcissists and we are supposed to be. There is only the infinite me. So if I'm looking at a blur and you're all singing and having a nice time, that's me singing and having a nice time. If you're all fighting and killing each other, that's also me fighting and killing each other because there's no you. There's just an infinity of me. That's our primary state, infantile narcissism. Hey, Terry. That's a primary state of infantile narcissism. As we grow, we develop boundaries as a defense 
to an increasingly complicated world. We learn language, we learn protocols, we learn ways of handling situations, we learn how to negotiate, we learn how to bully, we learn how to cry for attention, and so on and so forth. These walls that we build up, they can be crushed. They can then be crushed again. So what you can end up with, with borderline personality disorder, is a kind of a, a, a war-torn city, if you like. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Sarajevo. The, uh, they haven't been able to afford reparations uh, for the building. So if you go to the apartments there, you're still sleeping in apartments with bullet holes and mortar holes there because it hasn't, hasn't been fixed yet. The grounds are still where the mortars were, the sniper bullets are still in the walls. It's a war-torn city. It's a PTSD city. And the people are still in a state of shock because they can't move on because they can see the scars. That's the borderline. That's the borderline personality disorder. I can't cope, I'm not fully formed, and everything that I had was knocked down, but not obliterated. It would have been kinder to obliterate them completely, because now they live as half a person. They're half there and half, well, we, <laughs> borderlines like me, we live as half people. We're sort of there and we're not, but we know. We know, and we feel shame, and we feel depression, and we feel despair. The narcissist, God bless them, they have no fucking clue. <laughs> they stay in their shiny little dome. And because they're blocking out, they live inside of a shell. And on the inside of a shell is a mirror. And in that mirror, they're perfect. They have the perfect defense. A perfect narcissistic defense is a big, fat no. Borderlines don't have that option. We can't say no like that. We don't, we're not strong enough to say no like that. We'll say no. <laughs> no, if you think it's okay. So I can't cope, I'm not fully formed, I'm constantly signaling for help, consciously or not, even when I'm being abusive or bullying. The other element of it is intense emotional dysregulation. So you say intense emotional dysregulation or abandonment anxiety. These are cool sounding detached clinical terms. It is a shitstorm of terror inside of the borderline when triggered, not all the time. But when triggered, when they're in an emotional flashback, it's something else. It really is something else. And it's completely out of their control whilst they're in the flashback. Outside of the flashback, work can be done. Uh, therapy can be done. And the, the prognosis is pretty good. Um, if the borderline keeps turning up for the therapy, doesn't attack the therapist, doesn't attack the therapeutic process, which of course they do because of the superego injunctions that says don't get better. So. There's another element to it. Why would their superego injunction say don't get better? Because they've internalized the abuse. So now they're carrying around the abuse inside of their head. So they're abusing you whilst they're being abused internally. And their abuse of you is being watched by an internal abuser and judged and being shamed for. It's a real mess. It's much more complicated and there's a lot more going on than there is with pure narcissism. It's pretty simple clockwork, pretty simple. They're amazing. You're there to, you're not a person, you're a thing, you provide a service, you provide supply, and that's it. And if you don't, well, I'm bored of you, <laughs> and I'm gonna find somebody else who'll do the job that you're not doing. Bish, bash, bosh, finished. There isn't that much to it. It's a little bit more complex when we get into vulnerable narcissism, but it's not much more complicated than that. It's, do I, am I inside of a narcissistic shell? Yes. Have I got my narcissistic supply? Yes. Continue on, no more problems. With borderline, Another element to it is pressure testing. Were you pressure tested, sir? Were you pushed and pulled? Yeah, yeah. That's how you know you're in a relationship with the borderline. They push you and pull you. They'll throw you out to see if you'll leave. Go on, fuck off. I never, ever want to see you again. Get the fuck out of my life. You're all right then. Oh my God, are you leaving? You just, <laughs> you just told me to leave. Yeah, but I didn't mean it. I just wanted to see if you would. Okay. That's why we walk on eggshells, because you never know the rules. With a grandiose narcissist, a classic narcissist, you find out what pleases them and you're a good phone responder, you can get them to shut up 90% of the time. You just plug them back in. You're amazing. You're the most beautiful. You're the wealthiest. You're the cleverest. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Do you remember how awesome you are? Yes, I do, thank you. I'm huge, I'm the best, and then it's over. Borderlines, you can't do that. You can't satiate. It's insatiatable. That's not a word. There is no satiation. It is now, it's insatiable and I say it is. That's that. It's exhausting. It's an exo isn't it, sir? Yeah, I've done it twice. It's, it's really exasperating. Uh, some of you said you've been with borderline men as well. Yeah, yeah. 
So there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no off days, is there? There's no breaks. With Narciss, there is. You can have a good time. You might even get a week. Well, okay, not a week. Like three or four days, because then ultimately there has to be another cut to get more supply. You must bleed. They need that blood in the water to feed. Um, but with borderlines, it's, it's perpetual. And that's not even, that's not sadism. It's not sadism. It's because they can't sit with themselves. We can't sit with ourselves when we're in the borderline state. It's not possible. Do you know what the term borderline comes from? Originally, historically, it meant that the client was on the borderline between neurosis and psychosis. Psychosis. So here's a couple of things that help people who've been given the uh, borderline diagnosis. You cannot really have BPD versus PTSD or CPTSD, because the classic thing is for them to misdiagnose people with PTSD with borderline unless you are bordering on being psychotic. Psychotic levels of rage, psychotic levels of delusion, where you become extremely confused about what's real and what isn't. You cannot remember conversations. You don't remember who said what to who. You don't remember the intentions. Um, even to the point where it can look like, uh, like schizophrenic levels of delusion. Just whole stories, whole plot lines of your life are just made up. Do you remember that time when you did the thing with the person over there? It's like, I've never been, what are you talking, I've never been there. Never been there in my life. Yes, and also you love this type of food. I remember you specifically said Korean barbecue. I'm like, I've never eaten it. It wasn't me. Or it was the me that lives inside your head. Because just like with narcissists, you live inside their head. So with a borderline and the narcissist, they're never interacting with you. They're interacting with their avatar of you. And you are mummy. It doesn't matter, male, female, gay relationship. It doesn't matter. You're mummy. You're mummy. So I'm, if I'm with a borderline girl, I'm mummy. I'm a bad mother. The worst. I'd make a bad mother, wouldn't I? Yes, I would. <laughs> that would be creepy. So it's called uh, projective identification. Even if you're kind, even if you're stable, even if you are psychologically literate. Your psychological literary is nothing. They will tear it to shreds. They tear psychologists to shreds, therapists, psychiatrists, all day long, they eat them, they devour them and spit them out. Because all of the protocols of a normal, uh, a normal conversation that's consensual between two adults, between the designated objective, is destroyed. It's totally meaningless to the borderline. Because they are chaotic, their own internal landscape is chaotic. So yes, when you invited me for coffee at three o'clock, I know that you were telling me that you thought I was a piece of shit and that I'd failed in my life. I could tell by the way you said it to me. It's just coffee. You arrived at five past three, just like my mother did. You wanted to disregard me and tell me. They're obsessed with being a bad object. So a bad object in their psychoanalytic theory would be that the internalized idea that, the internalized idea that me as a baby is just fundamentally unlovable. You can't fix that through a relationship. You absolutely must forget the idea that you can fix that in a relationship. There is a chance in therapy with a very strong therapist who understands borderline personality disorder and knows what they're dealing with. But in a relationship, you're, you, are, you will either be pouring your life's energy into an infinite black hole that goes nowhere, or you can actually be throwing fuel on a fire. You can make them worse. You can make them sicker because you're indulging the psychosis. Ah, you are mother, you won't leave. Okay, mother, good. I'm glad you're gonna stay here. Have you seen this bit of torture before? Let's try it out for size and see how you deal with that. So in a sense, it's like uh, some horror movie, you know, the saw movies, the torture devices they trap people inside of, and the more you struggle to get out, the more the claws go in. It can be like that. Um, narcissists, it, it's similar with narcissism, but we know, you all know what grey rocking is, right? Grey rock? No, you don't know grey rock? It's a really shit type of rock music. It's boring as fuck. Were <laughs> 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 you, you nodding? You're like, I know grey. I have a fucking clue. <laughs> grey rock is a, is a technique uh, where, where if you really want to get rid of a narcissist, um, you don't have to threaten them or set boundaries with them or anything like that. You just stop giving them narcissistic supply. You're boring. Just boring. Not stonewalling, because you can excite them with drama. Yeah, they could turn into stalkers and they can threaten you and try and extort you. You must bore them, bore them off. Yeah, you're a little gray rock. Not a shiny pebble, 
not dramatic and exciting and funny, as we were saying. Nobody who produces adrenaline, nobody that they can get secondary narcissistic supply through, bore them to death. Don't, don't stonewall. I mean, we, we, we talk about going no contact because that, that's for you. So the least amount of contact you have with a narcissist, the faster you're gonna recover. Uh, just because it's, well, it's called a toxic relationship. They're a toxin. So if you have prolonged contact with them or you have sex with them or you're sleeping with them and living with them, that's gonna make you sicker than if you just have less contact. No contact is the ideal state, but it's not always practical. So to get rid of a narcissist, you gray rock. You become so dull that they would just move on to another shiny object. And it works, it works. Um, that's not gonna work with the borderline. Not at all, not at all. If, if you tried to do that with the borderline, they probably would try to consume you. They'd probably try to further internalize you to fuse and merge with you even more. Another element for recognizing borderline personality disorder, and then we're gonna distinguish between PTSD and BPD for the misdiagnosis. Uh, is the, well, where's it gone? It was right there. <laughs> Little fish, come back, it swam away. Oh, sorry, there it is, it's back. Oh, stepping neck. I was training this morning. I took a new pre-workout, it had niacin. Do you ever take pre-workout? Niacin, oh, yeah. niacin makes your face burn? Niacin rush. <laughs> niacin rush. I was stood in the gym like that, and my face is burning. <laughs> my face is, and they was, what did you, I took, you your ears. Yeah, the ears and your neck. And they were like, what, what have you taken? I said, pre-workout. They're like, oh, why, yeah, pre-workout. They come in a little bag like that. <laughs> this pre-workout's intense. Um, what am I talking about? Oh, yeah, so borderlines, what they'll try and do, another way of recognizing it, and that this will be the, the cause that, the borderline topic is a big topic and I've not really covered it on YouTube. The reason for that is because people who've been misdiagnosed with BPD just attack me in droves and I get tons of really boring emails telling me what a piece of shit I am. I can't be bothered. So, um, and these people are not borderlines, they're narcissists, but they've been misdiagnosed with BPD. It's, it's, it's so overdiagnosed, it's, it's ridiculous. If you feel like you have been recruited to moderate somebody else's emotions, that's not narcissism. That's borderline. I need you to moderate how I feel because I can't do it. I don't have the internal boundary, boundaries, boundaries, boundaries to moderate my own emotional regulation. That's your job. It's not very nice. I instrumentalize you because I just can't deal with my emotions. So you're mummy again. Mummy, fix it for me. And you remember, you cannot be a good mother. Even as a man, you cannot be a good mother. You're always a bad mother. So as a woman, if I was with you, I would recruit you to moderate my emotions. You would covertly take on that contract unconsciously. You'd be like, you'd, you'd understand it on some level. You'd be like, well, she's, she's kind of presenting herself like a helpless child, a vulnerable child. So <laughs> there was a wry smile on that gentleman's face. Just like that. <laughs> yeah, did that one. So she presents herself as a vulnerable child who needs help, who needs uh, parenting. And then you, t you, you just go, well, okay, that's not the worst thing in the world. I guess this is what happens in relationships sometimes. And you take on that role, but you will fail. And she will let you know, you are a bad mother and you failed me and you failed me and, and it doesn't matter what you do. You get with a man and he's a borderline, same thing. He, he will make you his mother. And that is, in the worst way possible, in no noble sense whatsoever, in no decent noble way is he asking you to be his mother. He's basically recruiting you as an instrument to moderate his emotions. At that job, you will fail so that he can enjoy uh, masochistically the pain of your failure again and again and again and again. You're forced into his or her repetition compulsion and you will be in the role of betrayer no matter what you do, you let me down again, didn't you? I knew you would. And then you'll feel tremendous guilt and shame. And you'll be like, what the fucking hell's going on? Why do I feel so guilty and ashamed? Because that person is putting those emotions into you. It's kind of a, it's, it's a role play that's being, that's being carried out. So that's how to recognize it. That's the distinction between borderline and narcissism. With narcissism, I'm sure you're all aware of the signs of knowing that you're with somebody who's highly narcissistic, they're bullying, they're exploitative, they lie, 
Borderlines also lie, but there's more confabulations there because the internal landscape is such a mess. Remember the image of the bombed out, bombed out buildings? That will help you. That's the, the personality structure is extremely damaged. Um, the narcissist will hold to a very uh, over-inflated false version of themselves and even have false stories about their history. Borderlines less so. The only parts of their history that they will falsify is the parts of their history where they were abused. So they will tell stories about abuse that didn't happen. It's not because they weren't abused, it's because they're obsessed with the idea of being abused. For a borderline, any and all interactions can be potential for me to be the victim. All the time, no matter what. So the simplest misunderstanding, the simplest invitation for coffee or, or whatever, can be uh, received with totally inappropriate and totally disproportionate emotions because they're emotionally dysregulated and that affects the uh, perceptual filters. With narcissists, it will feel more like you're just being steamrolled, like with a grandiose narcissist. You don't really exist. I'm here. There's only space for me. You're my audience and that's it. You're instrumentalized, but in a different way. I'm a borderline. I need you to regulate my emotions. I'm a narcissist. I need you to be my fawning, loving audience. Thank you, audience. You have made my evening so much better. So that's quite easy. If from that perspective, it's easy to see the difference between the two. The effects, the uh, abuse has different effects on the individual. We'll get into that in a moment. There's an idea that I have. When you have a graph, is that the y-axis up and down? Or is that the x-axis? That's y. This is x, yeah? So on the x-axis, between uh, PTSD and BPD, my humble opinion, or it could be CPTSD, and very frequently it is CPTSD that people are misdiagnosed with because the uh, symptoms are so similar. The only thing that I would look for in BPD for to be convinced, people can be somewhere on, on this as a, as a spectrum, is entitlement, and exploitation. So entitlement and exploitation are what we're looking for. So uh, some people will uh, worry when they see descriptions of CPTSD and see descriptions of borderline, they'll think, maybe I'm borderline. If you're not extremely entitled and very, very exploitative, in my humble opinion, you have no business receiving the uh, borderline diagnosis. It's not helpful to tell people who are traumatized that they have borderline personality disorder just because they are emotionally dysregulated. When people are emotionally dysregulated and they have PTSD, they self-harm. They engage in self-destructive behaviors. They have turbulent interpersonal relationships. They have all of the classic BPD signs, but they're not entitled for BPD to be, to be, for BPD to be, BPD, it's kind of hard to say. Hello. Hello. Come in. It's so I'm already disturbed. <laughs> My mother did that. <laughs> Hello, mother. Still making these videos, mother. Um, where am I? I'm here. Uh, BPD, yeah, for it to be that, if somebody's just emotionally dysregulated, and they are fusing and merging with another person, all of that comes under PTSD and CPTSD as far as I'm concerned. And it's not a personality disorder. Personality disorders are permanent, pervasive, and personal. That means that they're not context-specific, that they're not temporary, and they're not just one part of the person in, in one certain scenario. You know, for a personality disorder to be that, that would mean if you drop that person on a desert island, they would be a BPD on a desert island or a narcissist on a desert island. This is, when people get the BPD diagnosis, it's not, that's not it. That isn't it. Emotional dysregulation, uh, including warped perceptions, uh, unstable sense of self, unstable goals, unstable values, all of that very easily um, explicable with CPTSD or PTSD. The entitlement of BPD, and I'm not going to ask you, <laughs> but you can ask yourself, 
The entitlement of BPD is this, and those of you who've been with BPDs will know it. I have the right to abuse you because my pain is unique. You don't know what I went through. Nobody went through what I went through. That is narcissism. That is narcissism. If there is no narcissism in the borderline you show me, they are not a borderline. They have CPTSD. The exploitation is rooted in a martyrdom complex. I can be an arsehole because something bad happened to me. It's grievance-based. It's a grievance-based personality disorder and all of the functioning is past-focused. Because of things that happened to me when I was a kid, I can do terrible things to people today. So if you're not entitled and you're not exploitative, deliberately and consciously, in my humble opinion, it's not BPD. Oh, it, I got, I, sorry, I got the diagnosis before. Mm. I, I had a lot of suppressed trauma. Mm. And that came up after the diagnosis. Yeah. The diagnosis was like a year in therapy. Yeah. I just stopped drinking and it was like... You just stopped drinking? Yeah, I've been away and yeah. just like stopped using drugs and alcohol, yeah. basically, and then went back in, and I was like, okay, therapy's starting to work. Yeah. And then it was like, boom, this diagnosis. And I was like, what, never heard of this. What, what's this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't even know, like, it was like the trauma was underneath, mm. and I hadn't even kind of got to that bit. Mm. And then I kept digging and digging, and I was like, oh, trauma. Mm. Oh. Trauma. More trauma. More trauma. And underneath that trauma, more trauma. <laughs> trauma sandwich. Trauma sandwich. It's like trauma geology, isn't it? Through all the, the rock layers through the Earth's crust. Did it help you having the BPD diagnosis? No, no, no. Total opposite. Total opposite. I had the BPD diagnosis, mm. and then I've been scapegoated a lot all my life. Mm. So then I was like... Oh, okay, so it's my fault, it's my problem, I've got this diagnosis, mm. I've got the answer, it is me. It is my fault. It's all me. I knew it was my fault, just like mother told me, I'm a piece of shit. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> this was fun. <laughs> now I'm better. <laughs> well, no, it's like, okay, if it's all me, yeah. now I know I can do differently, I can yeah. do things differently. Sure, sure. Jocko then... Willink. Sorry? Jocko Willink. Jocko Willink. Extreme ownership. It's, well, it's, it's, it's actually uh, Marsha Linehan who created DBT. She has the same concept with a different name, which is... Well, that's what I looked into. What's it called? What does Marsha Linehan say? For extreme ownership. One of you must tell me now. Because <laughs> I've forgotten. Radical. Radical acceptance. There we go. Yeah, that, that was it. Yeah. Radical acceptance. So even if, it, even if you know it's not your fault, you accept it. MPD. So yeah. I, I walked... I went from that diagnosis yeah. I walked straight into kind of his... Trap, if you like. Who's trap? Some guy. A dude. Yeah, he might have had an MVD. I don't know. Okay. Because that's when I started looking at all this stuff, the MVD yeah. stuff. Like, so I was like, something's going on. Yeah. And I don't know, and I can't press all it. Yeah. It out. But yeah, it kind of, so that diagnosis led me astray. It led you astray, which it typically does. And all they're doing is they're looking at the symptoms of uh, PTSD and they're saying, okay, this is BPD. I mentioned before the soldier stuck in the trench and he's getting bombed and then the, ba the layers of his ego boundaries start fracturing as everything around him starts fracturing, or her. He eventually ends up in an infantile state. And typically, or commonly, people before they die, who do they call out for? Mother. Mother. Because you're, not, you're now not a 35-year-old combat veteran. Now you are a three-year-old little boy or little girl trapped in a situation that's bigger than you can deal with, and that's the last word that comes out of your mouth. So we know it happens, they're regressed to an infantile state. There was a paper I uh, was researching, I, I, I stumbled across it, I was looking at um, borderline personality disorder and at how it crossed over with vulnerable narcissism, fragile narcissism, covert narcissism, and uh, they'd, um, they'd interviewed some uh, American Marines and they were veterans who had PTSD. Some of the people were given they were all given therapy for PTSD, and for some of them it worked. And then there was this group that were really unresponsive to therapy for PTSD. And when they tested them, they tested them for borderline, they found 80% of them had borderline personality disorder. What do I take from that? What I assume is that if you went through a highly traumatic experience as an adult, I don't know, you, your friend got killed in sniper fire, or there was an IED, or something like that, and you didn't have pre-existing trauma from childhood, 
you would be traumatized, but with therapy, you would overcome it. But some of these people had CPTSD from their childhood. And when the very bad thing happened in their adulthood, they were not malingering. They were not like, oh, we just want to stay on benefits and we don't want to go back to work. We don't want to go back to the front line. They genuinely couldn't recover. They didn't have the capacity to recover because they weren't given the tools for that when they were in childhood, which is a, which is a really critical element of this. So to anybody watching and to you, I would say, unless you are entitled and exploitative, I don't think it's useful to call this borderline personality disorder. Psychosis thing? I was like, well, that's not me. You're not psychotic. No, no. But when, but when we're on, just come through. It's okay. Um, well, you don't need to do that. <laughs> just do what Steve did and just dance across the camera. Um, I mean, obviously, what's interesting is the, the drugs and the alcohol. So when we're on drugs and alcohol, what's the difference between that and borderline personality disorder? Nothing. If you're drunk and high, you're a psychotic for that moment. I mean, then it was total... Yeah, it's chaos. Yeah. Total chaos. Yeah. So when we see, clinically, when we see chaotic personalities, we reach for the umbrella term of schizophrenia, of schizophrenia, psychosis, delusion, or borderline personality disorder, and it's just gotten easy. Um, Marshall Linehan's system of di dialectical behavioral therapy, which has been shown to work with um, people diagnosed with BPD, it relies heavily on that Jocko Willink concept of, of extreme ownership. That's a way of reclaiming internal boundaries. That's a really good way of reclaiming internal boundaries for anybody uh, who's interested. Whatever happens in your life, assume that you own it. Assume that you can do something about it. Burn out all the victimhood. I've just been through a massive mental health crisis myself. Uh, back in therapy, I was doing therapy. At its peak, I was doing four days a week of psychotherapy. Um, I was drinking, I was using drugs again. Not proud of it, just telling you. Happens, I'm human also. And um, the victimhood narrative is poison. It's poison. It destroys you from the inside. Even if it's true, it doesn't matter. Even if you live as a victim, if you think as a victim, you're poisoned by that thinking, even if it's true. This is not about absolving people of blame or letting people get in the way with bad stuff. Not at all. They should be shot. Bad people should be shot at dawn. I'll come to your question in a moment. Um, but the victimhood narrative, it's, uh, it really is wretched. The borderline personality tool, just to uh, wrap this up, it requires a victimhood narrative. It requires a grievance. The grievance must be historical. It must be because of what happened to me in my past, I'm going to do the bad thing now. That's where the entitlement comes from to engage in exploitation. The experience of being with a borderline, last little thing on that to help you recognize it, it will feel like a person is drowning, you've jumped into the water to save them and they're clinging to you so hard that you're both gonna drown. You will reach a point with a borderline where you say, it is them or me. I love you, I wanna save you, but I'm dying here. It's gonna have to be me. Otherwise, this tragedy becomes a catastrophe. Do you feel guilty for walking away? No. No, no. You, you, you knew you had to walk away. Yeah. Yeah, but you, you'd, you'd obviously been through it a long time, a long time. And then you, there is a kind of a breakdown, right? Where you go, you cry because you grieve the fact you can't help them. That child is abandoned. It's, it's tragic. But the greater tragedy would be if you went down as well. It's for them to sort themselves out. And this is, this is a hard lesson for life. I'm not gonna go on one of my Jordan Peterson style cultural rants. I swear I won't. Um, we, we, we must walk away from the codependent, addictive pleasure of helping people to do things that they have to do themselves. It's, it's, so, it's, so, it's so hard to do, especially if you're a nice, decent human being. We're cooperative by nature. The majority of human beings are cooperative. That's how we evolved. We like to help each other. We like to bond. We like to help. But there are some things you must leave people to sort out themselves, and that includes letting people fail. We have to let some people fail. It's not natural to try and save everybody all the time. It's, uh, it sounds brutal when you say it like that, <coughs> but a society and a culture cannot function along those lines. And well, you just have to make your own damn bed, bucko. Well, how long have I gone on for? Let's take questions. Should we do some questions? Yeah, yeah, that's 45 minutes. We'll do some questions. I'm sorry my nose is running. Well. <laughs>
What are you saying, Terry? Do you all understand everything I just said, just as a general question? Yeah, yeah, okay. Mechanics are interesting, aren't they? I saw you nodding your head off. You're like, have you ever lived that one? <laughs> done that, done that, yep, yep. <laughs> Both with the borderline and the narcissist as well, I noticed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> vulnerable narcissists? How do you distinguish from uh, I don't. So I wouldn't distinguish between a vulnerable <laughs> narcissist and BPD. We're going to have to get rid of BPD. It's just vulnerable narcissism. Right. So, so they are, and, that, and that's not just me saying that, the weirdo on YouTube. There are proper people with letters after their name. Can't remember the, the lady's name, she's a professor. She wants it renamed emotional dysregulation disorder and taken out of the cluster B because they won't accept CPTSD. Okay, fine, we're not gonna win that battle, fine. Um, but emotional dysregulation is a big push to, to call it that. Vulnerable narcissism is what it is. You're a, you're a narcissist, but you're fragile. There are people in the BPD community who get really angry with me. They want to hold on to the title. And I'm like, but it's, it's abusive. Just let it go. What are you holding on to? You don't have, they're trying to clean it up. They're like, yeah, we're diagnosed borderline, but we're nice borderlines. We're quiet borderlines. We're cool borderlines. It's like, no, you're not. Stop it. It's a form of narcissism because the pain has, has made you self-focused, which is natural. It's normal. I mean, if you smash your toe on the corner of the bed, your world is toe. Like, all your energy goes whoosh, down. If your heart is smashed, all your energy goes inward. You can't help me if you're brokenhearted because you, you need it. You need help. You could try, but eventually the conversation's going to have to come back. And you've all lived that. You've been with people who you've tried to get help from. There are therapists out there who do that. They're brokenhearted and they start instrumentalizing their clients. Can I just say one of the things I've found? You must wait for the microphone. Everybody, must, everybody needs to hear. It's not a question. I don't want you to make statements. What do you think this is, a meeting of communists I'm or something? <laughs> I'm a bit, I've come here to make a statement. Yeah, go ahead. So about 25 years ago, this um, woman said to me, there's nothing as powerful as a victim, and I was, because I was one. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, God, that's terrible. That's really cruel. Mm. But I found that to be absolutely true, mm. that they will, and when you're using the analogy of jumping into the water to save them, mm. You fucking save them and you drown and they go and find somebody else. They yeah, yeah. never drown. Yeah, no, they, they never drown. Well, okay, so perfect, perfect. Because what you're talking about, I didn't want to go too deep into that, but it's a signal. It's not a real communication. They're not really as vulnerable as they claim they are. They're, they're, not, they're not addicted to narcissistic supply as we would know it with a narcissist. They have their borderline supply or vulnerable narcissist supply. It, the milkshake must be flavored with pity. Whereas the narcissist wants adulation, you're the best person in the world, the best singer, the best whatever in the world. The borderline wants, you are the biggest victim in the room. You're the biggest victim in the room. That's what they crave. And if you try to offer them adulation, they would feel, they would feel uncomfortable or they would try and turn the adulation into something like, oh, you're victimizing me with this adulation. You know, you're, which you, you all know celebrities who've done that. You're victimizing me with the adulation. You're driving me crazy. You're giving me mental health issues and depression by telling me I'm wonderful. It's a, it's a borderline response. Um, so there were hands up for questions. Put up your hands again. Yes, sir. I know you didn't want to go on a Jordan Peterson run. <laughs> but, but you're going to provoke me with one anyway. <laughs> but there seems to be a lot of uh, pe kids um, not being told if they're girls or boys. Mm. Putin, Putin said it was virtually a crime against... Um, he said it was President Putin said it was a crime. Why yeah. do you think that's happening now in the West and not anywhere else? Do you want me to get cancelled? Because this is how you get cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open a topic that gets people cancelled. Why is it happening in the West? Well, yeah, because it doesn't happen in the East. It doesn't happen in Russia. It's not happening in Africa. It's happening in modern uh, yeah, Western ha countries. Do you think they're just copying the crazies in Hollywood? Or? I, think, I think that there's... What will I do when my YouTube channel is cancelled? <laughs> have, have you got work for me? Can I come and work for you when this is just... This is, yeah, taxi driving. Door work. I'll go back to door work. Um, YouTube's probably part of the problem. YouTube is part of the problem. So what... Here's my little Jordan Peterson rant. And it's in a Jordan Peterson style. Um, he, he likes the yin-yang model, the Taoist model, which is why he ill-advisedly equated women with uh, chaos. Because the old, <laughs> naming no fucking names, 
he ill-advisedly <laughs> equated women with chaos because he was talking about the, the principle of yin. And when that was first translated in the 1920s, it was chaos. But back then, the word meant potential, just pure potential. So you can, there's different ways of approaching life and different ways of approaching a culture and protecting people and doing politics. You can have toxic yang, toxic yin, noble yang, noble yin. We're in a phase of toxic yin. Toxic yin comes with the best of intentions. I want to protect you. I want to make you safe. You are my children. Hmm. Anybody see a problem with that? Well, you're not children. And if you are children, then I'm your parent. We're now not in a horizontal relationship. We're in a vertical relationship. It's infantilizing. The period that we're living in now, what do we call it? The nanny state. Well, a nanny would typically be female, usually. That's what we have. It's toxic yin. So by making... Did I just assume the granny's gender? Or? Did I just have assume... Have you just the, assumed the gender? I assume the nanny's gender. <laughs> and I refute that gender now. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably racism. <laughs> you could claim racism afterwards. I'll get cancelled for that as well. Fuck it, let's go for it. <laughs> this is my last seminar. This is how I'm going out. Um, going in on psychosis then. <laughs> you may, you may. So, so what we're doing is we're saying, I was a radical leftist when I was a kid. And um, I think that a lot of like radical leftist perceptions of the problem in the world are correct. The solutions are usually wrong. So if you said something like systemic racism exists, I'd say it does exist. What's the solution? The radical leftist solutions, I'm a bit like, whoa, hang on, <laughs> just slow down. We do have a problem, but that might not be the best way of dealing with it. What do we want? If I stand in my radical leftist space, I want inclusivity. I was bullied as a kid. I don't want anybody bullied. I, wa I don't want people being left out. I don't want people to feel like they're stuck in rigid roles of things that they have to do. I didn't enjoy it as a kid. I hated being told I had to play football. I wanted to sit around and, I don't know, daydream. I didn't want a physical violence with other boys. I hated it until I found martial arts. And then I really enjoyed it. So I was a gentle kid and I was forced, like, if you don't do this, what would they say at school? They're like, oh, it's an old 80s derogatory term for a homosexual, puff, you're a puff. And that's what I would be called as a kid and I was bullied for that. So I hate that. So as I grow up, I'm like, well, that should never happen. So what do we do? If somebody doesn't like the gender role assigned to them, obliterate all gender roles and let everybody be exactly what they want to be. On paper, that sounds okay. And that's like a libertarian ideal, which is do what you want. As long as it's not hurting anybody, go ahead and wear a dress, wear makeup. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> wear everybody else's dresses. I do not give a fuck. As long as they're consenting to it, I don't care. This is the Slavoj Žižek point now. We switch from JP to uh, the big Ziz. Because he understands psycho psychoanalytic theory, which, uh, which both do, but Žižek is more of a Freudian and JP is more of a Jungian. When we give a permission, it becomes an injunction. So if I say to you, you may be gay, you may be gender fluid, that eventually becomes, you must be gay, you must be gender fluid. Not overtly, it's understood in the unconscious. It's understood in what is not said. When, that, when we veer that way, what happens at the other end of the spectrum? Well, I wanna be heterosexual. Well, that, no, no, that's not, that's not what we're doing, you see, because we're doing alternative things. And slowly, 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 things can creep to a point where you start saying, that's not okay, because that's normal. And we're for promoting that which is alternative. So it's just, it's an imbalance. It's a total imbalance, I think, that's happening now. And it's disturbing. It's disturbing to me to have to have a conversation about whether we're gonna give hormone-altering drugs that change you for life to children or whether we're gonna cut off the penis of an eight-year-old, which is a, a Texas court case that's going on now. I'm not sure an eight-year-old can know that, and I'm not convinced to a nicety that the parents aren't influencing them because parents influence their kids. So we move into a territory where everybody goes, like, you feel it in the room, now everybody's like, fuck, I know. <laughs> so you're gonna fucking say next? I'm gonna be here when it gets canceled. It's a tricky issue, so what do we say to people? They're your children, so where's, where's the distinct boundary between what the state can and can't do? But we've definitely moved too far into yen. Go on, mate. You're gagging to say something. Badge. The Marks and Spencer's badge. 
Yeah, the, the, the pronouns that you, you can call somebody. The pronouns that you can call somebody. It was in the newspaper, so... Yeah. His, his, hers. Well, again, like... So, so I, I'm, I'm for... I'm, I'm for that in principle, but it's like, if I know Steve and Steve says to me, listen, listen, lad, I want you to call me Z and Zer. I wouldn't say, well, fuck you. I know him. So if he's got a preference, I'll just go, why, why be a prick? Like, that's what he wants to be known as. That's a permission. And that's consensual between two adults. These things are injunctions. Has it ever happened before? Well, like, what's the outcome if it keeps on going on, on and on? You're asking me... I'm not me... trying to get you back there. No, 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 but you're asking a good question, which is historically, is there a claim by some people that um, when, we, when a culture reaches an obsession with sexuality and gender roles, it tends to be on the verge of collapse? I have heard that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think the evidence is overwhelming for that. What I think we're doing is we're reaching, um, we're reaching a point, like a crisis point like a human would, like a midlife crisis, but we're not in midlife crisis. As a species and as a culture, we're in the crisis of where the teenager becomes like a young adult. So we're struggling with our adolescence. All of our obsessions are adolescent. The pronoun thing is a kind of fragile narcissism. You should respect a person's pronouns, but the government shouldn't mandate that. So if you say, I don't want to, like permission is permission. Freedom is freedom. It has to be freedom for all or freedom for none. It can't be freedom for some based on a sliding scale of victimhood. That's really dangerous. And what will it create through that Freudian effect? We will eventually see the inverse pop out the other side. So as a radical leftist, I am, where I am a radical leftist, I'm more of a classic liberal, but I understand radical leftism. I would be worried for those minority groups now. They're, in, they're under more danger than they ever were before. And by the way, what are we doing about women nowadays? Have we fucked women off? We fucked women off. Feminism, like, I thought we were protecting women. That stopped. That stopped now. I'm going to stop now because what I'm going to say next. <laughs> well, we're trying to Richard. help the fellas, aren't we? <laughs> so, we're going to start talking about MMA soon. And people getting cracked and... No, no. I'm not Joe Rogan. I don't have 100 million in the bank. Do you yeah. reckon it started like, in the 90s when we, it then was police person and... Yeah. yeah, that's when it kind of started, wasn't it? Well, it's, 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 po it's political correctness, which I don't think is the worst thing in the world. Like, well, political correctness gone mad. I think that, that you shouldn't be a dick. Like, you shouldn't hurt people. Don't, just don't be a bellend. Like, if I was in charge, that would be on the posters on all the motorways ever. It would be my face like that. Don't be a bellend, OK? <laughs> just know, try not to be a prick. in my daily story. Just yeah. don't be a... Just don't Not be an arsehole. Um, so, so if you, because like, look, in the police, all joking aside, bullying happened. And there was a case in um, Merseyside police where eventually a woman, she, she committed suicide. I think she'd gotten either into a tactical unit or an armed response unit and she was bullied so badly that she killed herself. It happens. We, we as a society of decent adult human beings should try to stop that. But how? How do we stop how do we stop evil? Evil exists. We should resist it. How? By policing words? Is that how we stop evil? Evil's been with us forever. This isn't Narnia. It's never going to be Narnia. There's no unicorns. There's no rainbows. Yes, madam. You were saying the other night about um, you know, what's going on at the moment in Toxic Yin. And mm -hmm. you, know, you don't think we'll have to do an awful lot to resist this. No. But what do you think we should be doing? And what do you think the outcome will be? And... Um, when, will, when will this the toxic yin break and we'll get back to a little more balance? When will the toxic yin break? Well, well, it is breaking because if I did said what I just said in a seminar in 2017, the response would have been not not great. It would have been it would have been pretty it would have been hard for me. Um, the people there would be people in the room who would have got up and left. There'd be comments, or yeah, people would have really hated it. Have you changed politically in the last three or four years? I'm just hardened. <laughs> I like that. Political hardening. Political Viagra for all. I, I, I would say that there's, there's been a bit of a sea change. You know, there's, there's people like leftists like me have gone, uh, hang on a second, what, what are we doing? I want to... 
I don't like pe people being bullied. I really fucking don't. But what do we do about that? Do Okay, so here's a question for you, just as a general philosophical thing. Is it better for me to rush in and protect you from an abusive husband, or should I go and train you in Muay Thai so you can knock him out? I mean, I, I, I actually, I, I lived that. I lived that when I was younger. One of my first clients um, as a self-defense instructor, lovely lad, um, he was about 21, and his boyfriend was 42, and they were both big lads. They were both tall and, you know, they call them, I think they're called bears. And I, I know they're called, they're bears. Um, and his boyfriend, the older one, when he got drunk, he would hit him. So we'd show up. I was doing, um, uh, we were travel reps together. Lo Alex, his name was, lovely, lovely guy. And he'd show up with bruises on his face where his boyfriend had gotten jealous and smacked him. So I had the choice. I could smack the boyfriend or I could take Alex down the beach a few times a week and show him some moves. And I think in within about five weeks, the next time his boyfriend came in, Alex did what I could have done, but Alex did for himself. Which one's better? Yeah. Well, generally speaking, it's better to empower people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You then have the self-respect of knowing that you did that. How awesome is that? If I come and help you, who gets the narcissistic elation? Me. I'm a fucking superhero. I'm a policeman, da, da, da. You did it. When I got Alex to do it, I was like, this is, this is amazing. I was so proud of him. I was so pleased. And his boyfriend stopped. Because if I... If I do it and it's top down and it's author that's authoritarian, don't worry, I'm going to fix this for you, kid. What if I leave? Which I did. I went off. Oddly enough, I left to join the police, funnily enough. Um, Alex would have been on his own, but Alex had the power to do it and that's, that's better. So I think that's where we're going to move to because people are waking up to that. Let's empower people. Let's, that sounds, that's, that's a fucking horrible word, that. let's empower people. So that's where it is. What age would that start at is. then? What age would you start doing that? Because we've got to start with it. We like, Four we're all, we're all straight away. Yeah. Straight, the, 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 the day you're born. Saying, like adults yeah. now. The day you're There's born. No us, you there? get you we've get a with. kettlebell yeah. and a dummy and a boxing bag. No, I, I would say straight away. Just the whole, the whole of our template should be, we are strong, and we respect each other and we help each other. And if somebody's being bullied, we all do something about it but we also have to ask the person who's being bullied to help themselves. It's, the, it's our assumptions, our coordinates craft the culture. And, sorry, I spat everywhere. Craft. <laughs> they craft the culture, they craft our reality. So we're psychologizing everything. We assumed that kids all had fucking me mental health disorders, ADHD, dyslexia, social anxiety, depression, anxiety, and the kids go, well, maybe I do. Do I get points off my exam? Do I get an extra half hour? They're, they're fucking kids. You're going to put the cookie in front of them and, to, and expect them not to eat it? Of course they're going to eat it. Or we can say, look, but this is what I did in schools. I'll teach you some meditation. I'll teach you some self-hypnosis. We'll regulate your emotions. We'll teach you how to set goals. Have a bit of a sense of humor about things. You know, create, change the school environment, change the atmosphere. And that's, you know, we have to agree that we're trying to raise healthy, young, strong, resilient adults and I'd go into the education space and they hated it. Sonia Poulton's trying to get psychology into at least junior schools, mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. a basic sort of... Yeah, but it must, be, it must be the psychology that leans more into stoicism and philosophy rather than that type of psychology that sees everybody as being sick. Sorry, there's a hand went up over here just before. Real the time, it? It was you. Let's go. <laughs> I don't know which thread to follow now. No, I've, I've thrown, a th a few, okay. thrown a few out there. No, and I respond to most and don't want to put in. Mm. So now I've gone a bit blank. Okay. Right, first <laughs> of all, right, say a person was so stressed, they may or may not have been tipped into psychosis, mm. but you've got an idiot, inverted commas, mm. diagnosing. So that's, to me, not very helpful, because mm. it's misdiagnosing, causing more stress than there was in the first place. Mm. And if the power, and I'm coming back to the RAF ethic, mm. not because I'm mad on aeroplanes or bombs, opposite. Mm. In fact, I could bore you all with ironic stories, but that's for the please pub. Do, please don't. No, that's for the pub. <laughs> pub talk, my dad talk. said. Mm. Um, but what if there is a valid um, 
reason that you cannot leave the narcissist happily being narcissistic, mm. and that's where I bring in the metaphor of the Second World War, mm. not because I'm obsessed with that either, mm. or my father. Mm. It's to do you with... You have mentioned him a few times. I have, and I'm wearing this because of it, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, in commemoration. And it's to do with respect, it's to do with him respecting other people's rights and lives. We're, cir he, we're he, circling into a question here, I can feel it. Well, I don't know where I'm circling. <laughs> <laughs> Neither to be do I, imagine. <laughs> well, at least we know that, if nothing else. <laughs> what, did, you, did you have something that you wanted to... a statement or...? I'm trying to frame shall I, shall it. I, shall I take another question and I'll come back to you and you can gather? Yeah, I'm, gather, I'm, I'm yeah. hard to so gather, many yeah, I know, to I know. move into I, a clock. That's the way I talk. And that's partly because of the ADHD. So if you're all feeling a bit confused, just know it came from me. You know who's no, the blame. No, no. I've been accused of being psychotic. Yeah. Where I thought that my threads were weaving into a valid cloth. Yeah. Well, so I've got to oppose the power that is crushing me. Have a, have a think. We'll take another question. I'll come back to you in a second. Yeah. Uh, there was another hand. Uh, yes, sir? Um... Shut up. People... Shut up. Shut <laughs> up. I don't I want to get cancelled. <laughs> Go on, mate. Are people, uh, are people more mentally ill now than were they were like 30 years ago? And do you think in 20, 30 years people are going to be uh, more mentally ill than they are now? By any metric available, they are more mentally ill. It's not just that, yeah, it's not just that people are more aware of mental illness. That's what I thought it was. But no, the research is pretty conclusive. People are sicker now. They report misery. They're just, people are miserable. Like, not everybody all the time. But if you look around, like, you can, you can see it. The lifestyle's completely different. The, the lifestyle's a mess. People, in my humble opinion, we can't, we, we just can't live like this. We're not designed for this. We're communal creatures and we are atomized and we miss each other. We miss each other terribly, but we're trying to tell each other that we don't. And we need to get back to each other. When I said there's nothing to be done, there's no revolution. There's no battle, there's no war, there's nothing complicated. You just walk away from this toxic ideology, switch off the devices, switch off the TV, and let's just go and meet each other in the pub or in the park, have a walk. It's all there. Start fight clubs. Start fight clubs. Of course, it's the chap from Northern Ireland. Start a fight club, <laughs> smash each other in the face. It's like the film, yeah, it's the film fight club. It, it, it's, but that, that was, I think, Chuck Palahniuk, because that, that film, film fake clubs. It, it came out uh, not long after he wrote the book, and that was a real moment. It was pre-9-11, but if you remember in the book and in the film, it almost predicted 9-11. Uh, there was a moment there in 98-99 where we had reached another tipping point and the world really changed. Dramatically it changed. The, the chess pieces on the board flipped and we knew, the collective unconscious knew. So yeah, I'm not really saying anything different than what Tyler Durden was saying. I'm, I'm, I'm railing against consumer capitalism and that's why Fight Club begins tonight. We're gonna clear the chairs. You all have to beat me first. Um, go on. Like most people think that they've got choices mm. when they haven't all they've got is options and the only choices that you've got is where you spend your time and your attention and your money yeah. and that sort of thing absolutely yeah. 100 percent it's gathered so central to some of these cutting i can lose sight of the wood for the trees mm. and i know that mm. so it makes you stand back to review if you mm. can do that if it comes to mind yeah so cuttingly is honesty mm. Because people don't, to me, be honest with each other. Mm, mm. That's piled the stress on me to the yeah. point of being accused of I misdiagnosed blather. Yeah. And I've still got the equivalent of the Luftwaffe coming at me. Yeah. But I don't so think I, people can be... Um, sorry, what you said something about... Um, oh, it's gone. It's one of those fish that have gone... Oh, well, apparently uh, that's a sign of psychosis, so you, you're in a very vulnerable position. I tell you what, I tell you what it seems to be contagious. Folks, should we take a five-minute break, go to the bathroom and everything, and then come back and we'll start again? So we're going to look, um, in this section, we're particularly going to look at the effects of narcissistic and borderline abuse, and we're going to look at some um, 
recovery tools as well. Uh, I tried years ago to, to um, coin and then popularize a thing called NAVS, which is Narcissistic Abuse Victim Syndrome. Um, it didn't catch on, but there is a cluster of symptoms that you get when somebody has been the victim of narcissistic abuse particularly. Uh, one of the major effects um, with NPD and with BPD um, is a concept that uh, you're just raising now with social work and what happens when we're dealing regularly with people who are intensely emotionally dysregulated and they have PTSD. When I say emotionally dysregulated, do you understand that? Let me just explain that real quick. So emotionally regulated people will respond with proportionate, as in the intensity of the emotion, the size of the emotion is proportionate, and um, appropriate emotions. Here is a dog <laughs> upon the floor. And um, so when I see the dog, I, if I started weeping, that would be an inappropriate emotional response. And if I started weeping and rolling around on the floor and going, oh my God, a dog, that would not be proportionate. It wouldn't be appropriate or proportionate. So I would be emotionally dysregulated. The dysregulation issue um, is a term to kind of situate us back in the body. So your hormones can become dysregulated. Your cortisol can become dysregulated. And it becomes a hormonal issue. So it's not just some airy-fairy symptom. Your body is now out of whack. They talk about the dysregulation of the HPA axis without going too deep into that, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal axis. It's the way in which you start processing reality and recognizing threat. If it's dysregulated, so if I see a tiger, I should have a certain feeling. If I see my friend Terry, I should have a different type of feeling. If the tiger and the Terry feeling cross over, my relationship with Terry will be difficult and the tiger's gonna fucking eat me. Because I'll be like, all right, mate, do you want some cake? And then he's gonna eat me. So the dysregulation is uh, the idea that what's happening in the individual is they're going through a roller coaster of emotion. Major peaks and troughs multiple times a day. So um, when we're working with difficult people, this relates, or you're in a relationship with a difficult person, the person who's traumatized with PTSD, remember we said before, um, you have a child, and when they're in their infantile state, they don't recognize the boundary between self and others. If the environment is chaotic, they're chaotic. If the environment is violent, they are violent, because there's no boundaries. So with PTSD, you get this emotional dysregulation and a chaotic perspective of the world, but it's contagious. It's contagious. So if you spend time with somebody who's really emotionally disturbed, it's emotionally disturbing. This can be secondary trauma. They call it secondary trauma. You can get tertiary trauma. So the, the uh, pain and the emotional dysregulation can go through multiple people. So if I'm traumatized, I could hand that over to you and then you could go home and take it out on the dog, the kids. You're now emotionally dysregulated because of the time you spent with me. So people who are around narcissists start to change. And your friends and family will be like, we don't really recognize this behavior. We don't really recognize this new person. And a lot of that is down to secondary, uh, uh, secondary and tertiary trauma. So it actually transmits down. This is, these are not my ideas. This is published research. So with um, combat veterans, they found that if they were heavily traumatized and they had quite heavy PTSD and they went home, everybody in the family unit would start doubling down on their coping mechanisms. Kids watching porn starts watching more. The, uh, the wife does a little on online gambling or, or shops too much online. She's got a little bit of a shopping addiction. She does it more. He drinks too much. Everybody in the household feels this stress and this tension. And then we're all walking on eggshells and we're all stressed out. So we're all doubling down on what would be considered classic markers for borderline personality disorder because these are self-destructive patterns of behavior. And now we're becoming interpersonally turbulent and argumentative and confrontational with each other because our perspectives are skewing. We're not sleeping properly. We're not eating properly. It's a fucking mess. So how do you know that somebody's in a relationship that's narcissistically abusive? They become a mess. <coughs> uh, any of you think you got physically sick from narcissistically abusive relationships? 
I think I got physically sick. Physic so you've had it, you've got physically Chronic sick. Fatigue. Chronic fatigue. It's very common, very, very common, because it's exhausting. Um, yeah, chronic fatigue, I've heard of a lot. <laughs> Allergic reactions go through the roof, sleep issues. So if it's messing with the HPA access, mm -hmm. doesn't that mean that all abuse is physical abuse? You, like if the emotional, if it's dysregulating yes. re yes. that much? All abuse effectively is, is physical abuse. PTSD, if you traumatize somebody for long enough and the trauma is bad enough, what does it shrink? Hippocampus. Yeah, what does that look like? The little seahorse, the seahorse in your brain. So the volume shrinks. So there's actual evidence that your, what do they call it in psychology, your executive function, there's parts of your brain that start to rewire to the trauma. It's all fixable, thank God, because of neuroplasticity, but it takes time and we have to look at that. Yes, it's all physical. The gap between emotional and physical is mild. Uh, in my own childhood experience, it was physical and emotional. And the worst was the emotional abuse. The emotional abuse stayed with me, like a, a, bu a like a smack or a bruise or whatever. It fades somewhere that your body, it, your body, um, the emotional abuse. Your body feels it, it feels it as though you have been hit. But mm -hmm. obviously, you know, no, nobody can see that, but your body actually yeah. responds. That's to it. the idea. I mean, and I would, most of us would probably agree subjectively, like. You get slapped in the face. Well, what's the worst thing about being slapped in the face might be the emotional response anyway. It's actually not the, you know, because we do that in boxing and it, it doesn't mean if Steve catches me with a life hook, a left hook, you just go, well, that was a good left hook. I don't want more of that. But it doesn't mean, oh, I'm so ashamed and he doesn't love me anymore. And <laughs> Is it the intent bastard. behind the smack? Then? It's, the, in it's yeah. the intent behind the smack. It's context and intent. So humans are meaning making machines. So I guess, I guess we just, yeah. So all emotional abuse is physical and all the physical abuse is emotional. We'll do that, we'll say that. Yeah, okay. I will never credit you for that. I'll just take it. <laughs> I came up with this idea one day. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, we could, we could say that. Um, it all impacts the body. And I think, you know, uh, when we're talking about uh, therapy and protection, um, we have to be talking about what's going on in the body as well you have to have something somatically that you're doing to move that feeling around. So there has to be physical practice that you gotta to go to the gym, you gotta go to yoga, you gotta go for walks, you've got to move your body to help it to process. If you see a dog go through something, even if it's just like a minor trauma, the dog wants to go and eat uh, horse poo and you stop it from doing it and then you end up having like a bit of a confrontation with the dog and you eventually pull it away, when the dog breaks that obsessive moment where he's trying to chase somebody else's ball or go and eat another dog's poo, they shake. They, they, when the obsession breaks and you pull, them, you pull them away from that and they give up, they, they literally shake it off. They go, blah, blah, blah. all right, I'm not doing that anymore. Bang, and they walk off. We have to do that as well. We have to shake it off. So it's important that we're doing things that physically alter what's going on for us, even at the hormonal level. Meditation will help. Sleep, good sleep hygiene. Good sleep hygiene. I'm and terrible for it. Grounding as well. Terrible hypocrite for this. There are things, there are parts of your sleep cycle that are essential for you processing emotions. And if you're not hitting those parts of the sleep cycle, you will not recover from PTSD. You cannot have a high level caffeine addiction or terrible sleep cycles and expect to recover. You are not physically capable of it. Neuroplasticity. We've got to help the brain to heal. We've got to help the body to heal from all of this or we're going nowhere. I'll come to your question at, at, at the end. Um, so secondary and tertiary trauma becomes a problem. Where is it worse? What was the point I was going to make? Oh yeah. Uh, when it was a female combat veteran, the husband was got more secondary trauma than the other way around, which is interesting. This is published research. So if a woman comes home to her husband, and she has PTSD, he is more affected as a man than if a man comes home to a female partner. She's not as negatively affected. I don't, at this point in my life, culture and biology, I'm kind of thinking they're probably the same thing. Culture is biology, biology is culture. We've evolved for this. So we expect men to go to war. If I know my female partner has gone to war and she's hurt, that's not part of my cultural expectation. I'm not evolved for that, and I would find that I would find that very stressful. Um, but 
if a woman expects that and she knows, I don't know. I don't know why that is. I just thought it was interesting. But we have to consider the ways in which these things are contagious, like a physical illness. So you actually catch narcissism. Would you like to talk about how you've caught narcissism, madam? Yes. <laughs> You're a narcissist now. Um, so this is new for me. And I just had a conversation with Sam Backman about this a couple of weeks ago. And it explains a lot. In order for any two human beings to be in a relationship with each other, they engage in something called a shared fantasy. This is from a psychiatrist called Sander. He published uh, on the subject back in 1989. So the shared fantasy is a way for a couple to process pain, grievances, disappointments, frustrations, and successes within the relationship. It's me and you, babe. You have a third entity that is the relationship and you share in that relationship. Sounds okay, right? Like, makes sense, of course. So you have to have that. If the other person is toxic, you have built a bridge direct to your heart for them to spread that toxicity within the shared fantasy. It is extremely dangerous to be in a shared fantasy with an abusive person. Extremely dangerous and very hard to leave. With an abusive person, even after the relationship has ended, the shared fantasy continues to exist and you have to kill it. You have to find a way of destroying the shared fantasy, which will feel like grieving another person as well. So in that shared fantasy space, you effectively, um, how should I put it? Because there's consent, so you have to consent to engage in that shared fantasy space, you become a party effectively to your own abuse. The narcissist plugs you back into your own narcissism. The narcissist shows you your narcissism, plugs you in, and then feeds you your own narcissistic supply. It's sick. It's like, uh, you know those vampire movies where they don't want to kill the victim, they want to turn them into a, like a half a vampire? So they suck the blood out of them and they feed them back the blood. They're like, you have to drink my blood now. It's kind of kinky. But that's how narcissism works. They're giving you back your own narcissistic supply and you'll become addicted to it. When the relationship does finally end, there will be moments of um, depression and there'll be moments where you feel numb and like you feel like life has lost its color and its meaning and its excitement. You're actually going into narcissistic depletion. You're a narcissist who's lost her supply <laughs> at that point. It, it's not full-blown narcissism, obviously, but it's just an appeal to the most narcissistic parts that we all have. We all have latent narcissism. You should have latent narcissism. That's healthy, but it's, he's feeding you your own supply. So these relationships through the shared fantasy, uh, they create an, another alternate reality. Did any of you ever get the sense that you felt things for your narcissistic partner that were not real? Like the level of love you felt or the level of obsession you felt or the level of anxiety you felt wasn't quite real? Especially now it's ending. Sorry? Especially now it's ending. Especially now it's ending. These are things that uh, Sam Vatnin calls emotional artifacts and they're built through the shared fantasy. You are starting to feel and think as your partner thinks and feels. It's perfectly normal, it's perfectly natural that you would absorb the emotions in the world view of your partner. But if the person is highly abusive and narcissistic, you now have narcissistic patterns of thought and feeling running in your head. You may develop, if you're with a borderline, you can start to develop abandonment anxiety. You may have had a secure attachment style your whole life, and then you can start to develop this weird abandonment anxiety and get really paranoid about where they are and obsessed with ideas they're going to leave you. That's their abandonment anxiety that you're feeling. That's the instrumentalization. They've put their feelings into you for you to regulate them on their behalf. They didn't ask. Terribly rude. And it hurts and it's confusing because you feel like you're going crazy. So when people say at the end of the relationship, they go, I kind of feel like I was the narcissist. Well, you were in a highly narcissistic state in the end. It's the only way you can survive inside the relationship. Yes. Oh, sorry, the mic's coming. The mic man cometh. Thank you. Um, you know this concept of abuse that you use in terms of narcissism? Yeah. My, my, I divorced my wife who was with for 10 years. Mm. She was not abusive in any way, but mm. her, the way she was was that she was so unavailable. She would never validate me. She would never give me anything back. She was always very dismissive. Mm. 
Um, and I left that relationship thinking that it was me that there was the issue, you know, me who was the narcissist. And still today, I still question whether she was a narcissist. But after reading the literature and everything around narcissism, mm. she's classic, covert, I would say, narcissistic. Should we have a conversation about the definitions of abuse? Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> when you're saying abuse, I think... You think of someone smacking somebody. Well, well I think I know what, what definition of abuse is, but, you know, for, for me, her kind of withdrawing from the relationship and being on a phone for, like, 24 hours a day and, you know, not having a conversation with me or... Neglecting your partner is abuse. Uh, yeah, is absolutely, absolutely. Doing something that you know yeah. hurts your partner, makes yeah. them feel lonely and alienated. But then I'd rage, abuse. Richard. I'd rage because, of course. you know, but then I would blame myself and... Would you? It, yeah. Even. Wait, slowly. Slowly, I like that, slowly. Slowly. Yeah. Because there's a programme running now. Yeah. You've gone into it now. It's yeah. fired up. Yeah. Fired up the engine. You tell. Yeah. <laughs> Feeling it, man. Yeah. I'm in it too. Yeah. And I'm freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> this roller coaster started, but let's stop. Yeah. You were raging, and then you felt like you were the one who's in the wrong. Or did someone imply that you were the one who's in the wrong because you were raging? Well, uh, she, well, I went, basically I went through cancer treatment and she was basically kind of saying, oh, it's because, you, you, you know, you've had cancer and, you know, you do, you're doing this because of this and that. I wasn't, I was doing that, doing it because she was betraying me. Yeah. You know, she was doing so many things behind my back. Yeah. And not conversating, gaslighting all the time. Um, so she was leading a secret life? Yeah, well, she, I divorced her for many reasons. She was evading tax for four years and... You know, she was a, an alcoholic, you know, yeah. drinking a bottle and a half of wine every night. And, yeah. But I kind of felt that she can't be a narcissist because she's not abusive verbally. Yeah. She's very withdrawn. Well, we don't, we don't have to say maybe she had MPD, maybe she didn't, but she was abusive to the extent that she knew what was, she was doing was hurting you. Yeah. She wasn't meeting your needs. And you I told her. That too. You expressed yeah. it. I know you did. Thank you, Richard. I know you did. <laughs> she didn't fucking listen, did she? <laughs> no. She wouldn't fucking listen. No. And that's what made you so angry. Because mm. you're like, I'm in pain here. Yeah, for Fuck sure. face. <laughs> <laughs> and you're on your phone mm. whilst I die inside. What's mm. more important than the fact that your wife is in pain and dying inside? Yeah. What are you looking at? Sure. What are you scrolling? Yeah, that's, I'm angry. That's uh, reactive abuse. So I do something outrageous and then you respond and then you're the baddie. Exactly, yeah, for sure. I was, I was at RAF Kinloss once with, uh, with, with my ex, and that's um, <laughs> right at the north of Scotland. We were at the officer's ball at Christmas, and uh, she uh, made sure I was good and drunk, gave me a few shots, and then she whispered to me that she was cheating on me with, with a guy at work. I had a shit fit. I'm a 95 kilogram man. She is a 45 kilogram woman. I got thrown the fuck out of the officer's mess. <laughs> who looks like the baddie? Yeah, yeah. Me. Because it's obvious who the bad guy, like, look, like you're raging, you're freaking out, you're shouting, this girl's crying. Oh, this, and everybody's like, oh, poor girl, don't worry, we'll protect you. But she's shagging somebody at work. <laughs> I fucking knew she was as well. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no, it's okay. I'm over it now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can we do a session after? <laughs> oh, yeah, but thank you for that. No, I think, um, I think we have to just say, look, if you had needs and you were married and your partner was deliberately flouting those needs and letting you suffer, that is abuse. Maybe she has narcissistic personality disorder, I don't know. What you've described is incredibly cruel. That went on for years. It wasn't like she was grieving the death of her mom and she was being a bit of an arsehole for three months. Years and years and years, the same argument again and again and again. Is that right? How long do I, like, okay, I love you, but you're in the corner crying and you're asking me to not do something that I don't have to do, I'm choosing to do, for years. Yeah, that's abuse. Yeah. I think 100%. Just to get those little Yeah. Yeah. What, in the end, um, did you go to therapy for this? I'm in therapy now, yeah. And is it more, is it more mum or dad who's the withholder of love? Oof, wow. Or is it a combination? Well, what I've, what I've realised is that um, when you was going on about attraction at the beginning mm. of the session, mm. 
she absolutely replicates my mother who was emotionally unavailable. Right. Mm. So you you a repetition compulsion from yeah, the, sure. from mother. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So anything moving forward, we have to have that internal boundary there that says, I value myself enough to demand that if I'm giving somebody love, because if you give love, time and attention, that's the most valuable thing you have, you expect the reciprocation back from your partner. I know it sounds like I'm saying dumb things that are obvious, but there's a part of your unconscious that that isn't obvious to, and it yeah. needs to, to hold on to that. Sure. Like, I have to, I have to have that. This is a must. You can't be on your phone when, or ignoring me or withholding love. That's absolutely never gonna happen again. Um, does that resonate for you? Yeah, yeah. Me? I was like, <laughs> you, Me? you, does that resonate for you? This kind of reactive abuse, have you experienced it? Yeah. All kinds. You've, all of this kind of abuse you've experienced? Yeah. So uh, you've been in situations where you end up shouting and screaming and feeling like the crazy one. Yeah. Then possibly it's narcissistic abuse. Because if it's, if it's, if it was goal orientated and it was quite with a, with a flat effect and it was just like, I'm holding money over you, that would be a different thing. But if it's if we're talking like the deliberate ignoring of your pain so that that person can do something that's fully self-indulgent so that you feel like a piece of shit, then that, yeah, that's, I would say, that's narcissistic abuse or at least a very, very cruel... I mean, how, how self-sounding... She how, withheld money as well. She withheld money as well. Yeah, of course she did. Yeah, two years for her to contribute towards, towards an extension. Really? Yeah, she was earning loads of money too. And she just wouldn't do it? Do you, do you ever do boxing or anything? <laughs> I wanted to be a boxer, but they laughed me out of the gym because I was a woman about 20 years ago, so yeah. Misha, what do you think of that? Well. They laughed her out of the gym for boxing. Are you having that, mate? Misha's a good boxer. Mm -hmm. Terry and Steve are good boxers. Are you going to go back? <laughs> 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 uh, I'd like to do a bit of UFC, a bit of MMA. Yeah. You're going to do the old MMA? I'll talk to you about that later. Sound as a pound. <laughs> yeah, no, you should uh, get back in there, mate. Mm. Do it because it's something that, that you've got in you and you would, you would enjoy it. You definitely, you definitely would, would, would enjoy it. Um, so withholding uh, love absolutely has to be seen as a form of abuse. Like if you had a baby and it was crying with hunger and you didn't feed it, we wouldn't be confused, right? Is the baby crying loud enough to be heard? Yes. Am I expressing to you what my needs are? Yes. You're still ignoring them and I'm still in pain. What the hell's going on here? Something's really sick there. Really, really sick. Really wrong. Yes? Where would we differentiate between that and avoidance? Avoidant. Avoidant. Dance. Avoidance. An, like, an avoidant dance? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Um, I don't... I like, people who, who double down on uh, the avoidant reaction as a way of protection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I... You, you never really hear me. Withdrawal of everything. Yeah, you, but it's not the same somehow as no narcissistic you, withdrawal. You never really hear me talk about that much, do you? No. No. Do you know why that is? You just avoid it. I'm avoiding. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Terry. She thinks she's funny. He does the jokes. Listen here now. I've got security at the back. We'll be throwing you out because um, you avoid it. I, 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 I am not. I'm not convinced. By it. I don't think I don't find it a very convincing model. I think something is going on there. You're talking about the avoidant attachment style. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's to it's to be looked at, but I wouldn't I wouldn't thingify it if you know what I mean. So if you came to me and you had a partner and you went, this is an avoidant attachment style, I'd be like, all right, mate, are you emotionally immature? Do you want to be in the relationship? Is this do you have some sort of narcissistic issue? Like, what is the problem? Your partner's coming towards you, and by the avoidant model, you're doing this. The fuck is like what? So yeah, let's be together, but also not be together at the same time. Counterdependency, I think, has more validity. So there is there is a fear of intimacy. That's that I that I think has some validity. But even that, it crosses over with narcissistic personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So I would be looking at it and saying, okay, what are we really talking about here? Sometimes with psychology and the terms, I think they can cover as much as they elucidate. Is that the verb I'm looking for? Enlighten. 
they, they, can, they can obscure as much as they enlighten, if you know what I mean. So yeah, the avoidant style, it, it's definitely there, but I'm like, what, what are we saying? What are we really saying? Somebody wants to be in the relationship and then they're pulling out at the same time. Let's just call it emotional maturity or fear of intimacy. Seeing it in my head, I'm seeing it outside of relationships as well. And I'm okay. I guess my head's trying to thingify it, but it's exaggerated more than ever where people have this, a, shut, a shutdown response that is really exaggerated, you know? So non-replying, sort of ghosting, av avoiding of just any kind of response or interaction, when, but without, without reason, you know, without even getting into it to begin with. I think, I was listening to a podcast talking about this recently. So uh, I think it was a psychologist on trigonometry who was being interviewed and he said, we live in an avoidant culture. So it's not an avoidant attachment style, right. it's just an avoidant culture. So I, I didn't really follow, but it was more like what you're talking about, where we're all constantly trying to escape from each other, from reality, instead of engaging with the world, we're avoiding the world. Instead of engaging with our problems or with each other, we're avoiding our problems or avoiding each other. Is that more of what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, because it's been so exaggerated now and I see, I guess it, it's the overwhelm, something's gonna have to keep getting cut, you know, because we've got so many things grabbing our attention. Mm. I think now it's, it's encouraged this idea of, I've seen service staff doing it, you know, like not in, not in even, um, confrontation situations or where mm. they're being abused mm. like they literally don't like that they've got like fact this is over it's done you know and everyone's yeah. getting encouraged yeah. to kind of act that way and yeah. it's i think it's just i don't know it's like if you can get a boiling point of avoid avoidance then <laughs> yeah well if, if everybody is avoiding everybody else um you would have to ask the question like where where does where does that go um, yeah, i think that's what's being held over us and why this is continuing because mm. if we the cost of coming out of the globe, the, the group trance we're in, yeah. is that we have to face each other and all this. Whereas if we, <laughs> what the horror, <laughs> yeah. the horror. To get two willing parties to do that would be an achievement in my book. <laughs> I think it will take crisis. So the the um, the the avoidant issue and where that relates into like a broader cultural issue, and also with the narcissistic abuse because. What is being reported now? I spoke to, um, she's, she's a divorce coach, uh, Sarah Davison today. I did a podcast with her today and she keeps up with the statistics. And she said the reported incidents of narcissistic abuse are going through the roof. So if we live in a culture of avoidance, what would be the consequence of that for intimate relationships? My suspicion is the culture that we live in now uh, facilitates being being effectively narcissistic abusive in intimate relationships. Somewhat in business, somewhat in friendships, but if you're in an intimate relationship with somebody, you can treat them like shit. There's, there's no shame around it. There's no, like, it's, it's open war uh, between the genders. It's open war on the battlefield of sex and intimacy. Just take what you can. Be a savage, be a barbarian, be a bad bitch or an alpha male. That's the best thing you can be. Um, Sam Vaknin calls that invulnerability signaling. So we're all trying to signal to each other how much we don't need each other. Okay, really cool. So if you have a room full of apex predators, how would there be any bonding? If we're all too good for each other, how do we meet each other on any level? We, we can't. I think that might be the type of avoidance that, that, that you're talking about. So, so it doesn't create narcissistic abuse, but it facilitates narcissistic abuse. Go ahead. Uh, do you want to hear my, my outline theory of how the two are We're here now, I feel like I have no choice. Yeah, <laughs> that we're in an energy crisis as beings and that so people have different responses because everyone's deficient, so. Deficient in what? the energy that they just need okay. i don't mean just the energy to move around i mean like the the friction of interaction and mm. nurturing and mm. stimulation we've all been in energy crisis so mm. uh so the narcissist is like the predator mm. but the avoidant is like the stingy thing that does doesn't want to go out hunting but tries to close up shop sure to like you know um everything gets restricted but then okay. if you have people around going around you still want to trade 
yeah. and they're still trying to look for that creation of energy, yeah. then they can either like fall prey to the one who seems to want to engage, but really doesn't actually want to create anything they want to feed. Okay. Or the avoidant, I suppose it's that like echo chamber of, you know, creating hope and, and chasing someone down mm. when again, they, they're not really open for business. Yeah, that's an interesting hypothesis. I think it has legs. I think it has legs. I think it's a really interesting idea. So in like a love deficit world where nobody's paying you any attention at all, the one person who does pay you attention is going to seem even higher value than they would have done 30, 40, 50 years ago. Everybody's thirsty. Bunch of thirsty little fucks running around online trying to get their supply. Well, makes, then the next question is, so what's the normal then? You know, if there's generally, genuinely a drought, what mm. makes someone well adjusted? And I'd say they have to be some kind of alchemist who's who's finding that creation in something. Mm. You know, whether it is you're you're finding the interaction by mm. by presenting, mm -hmm. you know, or, or you have managed to scrape together enough genuine interactions that you can keep a fire going together. Right. That's a fucking bleak picture you paint, mate. Thank you. <laughs> Jesus. I'm really going to need that therapy. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I hear you. It, it does require, so, so if you're going to have anything good or build anything good, it is in despite of. It is not because of. Uh, relationships. If you build a stable relationship now, wow, well done. It's in despite of culture, yeah. not because of culture. So, yeah, there is a sort of a, a, a will and a shielding and an alchemy, and um, it's kind of a, it is kind of a magical process where you have to be inside the circle because all the demons are outside the circle kind of thing. It's, it's real warfare in, in a spiritual sense. Um, anybody got any questions that bring me back onto whatever the topic was? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, sir. When she was talking about her relationship with her husband and their business partner, you said, you asked her, is he a psychopath? Mm -hmm. How do you know someone, a psychopath or a narcissist, or you, can someone be a, a narcissist and a psychopath? Or is, are the two interchangeable? Or, or I, I don't know the difference. God help us all. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, right, so if you want the proper academic clinical answer, there's a video by Sam Vaknin. It's called uh, Covert and Classic Borderlines Question Mark. The clinical answer he's going to have to give you. It's something like the truth of these personality disorders, the mechanics of them, is that they interlock. And when you get into certain states under certain conditions, you start to flip between the personality disorders. He described what he called a covert borderline. When she feels that she is, I'm going to make a mess of this. When she feels that she is about to be abandoned and it provokes her abandonment terror, it's like dissociative identity disorder. Another personality steps in, another ego state step, steps in that is a pure psychopath to protect her. So you'd be like, oh, I know this girl. She's a classic borderline female. You try and abandon her, she becomes a pure psychopath straight away. So the mechanics of this are complex. I try and give like the, um, the folksy down home, like you can just walk away and you'll remember a few bits and pieces to protect yourself. But the actual academic answer to your question is complex. And it's not, that's not just Sam Vaknin's idea. The, this is, the, this is the, the cutting edge of where the research is up to. And even the DSM has made a much more nuanced uh, definition of borderline personality disorder that includes these things. So if you see it like, like, like clockwork, like, a mecha like the mechanical device, it click, 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 gets to this point, now I'm a psychopath, click, 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 now I'm a classic borderline, click, 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 now I'm a covert borderline. It's, it's fascinating. I don't know, I don't know how, much we how much we need to know. You, you, would be, you would do well to know, is this person borderline, narcissist, psychopath, so you know what to expect and how to defend yourself, for sure. For sure, but the truth is, it's it's pretty complex, and these things are comorbid, so that you you won't have a. It's so rare you'd have a pure narcissist that you're dealing with. They could be classic, grandiose alpha male narcissist with loads of money, but you'll also see elements of vulnerable narcissism there. He will be crying out for help sometimes, and it it won't be fake. It it, it could be real. It could be borderline there, histrionic. It 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 does get pretty pretty complex. 
somewhat complex, let's say, somewhat complex. Is that where splitting comes in? Splitting? Yeah. Um, well, th we're back to what we were saying in the beginning, which is, I suppose one of the themes I'd like people to walk away with this, I've not mentioned CPTSD, you've noticed, but I mentioned PTSD a lot because CPTSD can, can um, eclipse the importance of just trauma, the importance of trauma. Get back to basic trauma. Go and, go and review some literature on PTSD and the effect it has on people, the way it warps the personality, just being traumatized. Classic, straightforward PTSD. And let's remember, there's no PTSD without CPTSD, and there's no CPTSD without PTSD. But this is primal. This comes first. This comes first. CPTSD is the add-on to the original trauma. And um, it's contagious and it warps. It warps everything that it touches. What did you ask me? About splitting. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. I knew I drifted. Um, so these become um, primitive responses. So you're aware of like catastrophic thinking, black and white thinking, splitting. It's an infantile response. Mummy is all good or mummy is all bad. Mummy is the devil or she's an angel. Um, of course, as adults, we know every, everything is shades of grey. People exist on a, on a spectrum. Um, and splitting is an effort to push chaos, chaos into an ordered state by, Gad Saad calls it, epistemological dichotomania, uh, which means we're living through a time where we split all the time. So you're either a, a you know you're a, you're a left winger or you're a right winger, and if you're on the opposite team, then I must kill you because those are the rules of the game that we're living in now. Um, or you're on this side of the debate, you're a, a vaxxer, an anti-vaxxer, a masker, an anti-masker. It's split, 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 split. That's trauma. We're traumatized and we're infantilized uh, through this trauma as well. Yes. I'm just wondering it. Um, if one is used to PTSD, can you adapt to live with it if there's no other choice? Yeah, yeah, you can do. Um, it, would be, it would be a rough old life. I'm talking of major experience and background here. Yeah. I don't want to, I'm trying to frame it yeah. simple. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I don't want to go on about the DAD. Yeah. But the lovely lady there at the end... I've been dealing with cancer this year, big style yeah. return. Yeah. I've been treated so abysmally by blood relatives. Mm. Forget that, but I will, I'm not losing World War Three yet. Mm. So I know how, and then when you brought the mother in, then I had my answer to you, mm. why I've been using the D word, mm. AD. Mm. It's cause I hardly wish to focus on the dreadfulness of the mm. um yeah. that, that, oh, that's yeah. scary well that brings it that brings, because that, that, that brings us back into the theme of avoidance again so ah, you're avoiding but the mother but my dad mm. would not leave his children in charge of a really narcissistic lady mm. because although he was used to ptsd coming out of his ear holes mm. Mm. the right thing was not to leave Mm, mm. He had been pushed into another scenario of PTSD mm. as a father, mm. which he wasn't in the war, and mm. he wasn't growing up in Liverpool, poor, mm. Mm. no welfare state. Mm. So that's where I see it linking up, mm. even when someone else speaks, you know, I'm not all about just me and my dreadful mm. life or whatever. I'm hoping to get my son shining for what bit I've got left. I think... I think like the answer to, to your original question would be, uh, yeah, you can learn to live with it. I would really prefer that, that our ambitions were higher than that. I would want you to... But the consequences of choosing a selfish separation from a narcissist, mm. if we're going to call a spade a spade if the garden tool, you know, um, that would bring its own consequences of negativity. So a good in this case, male, because it mm. could be the other way round, and usually it is. Mm. And anyway, it comes back to mind games, Eric Byrne, I'm OK, you're OK, mm. and I want that for school, in fact, before they're out of nappies. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I because agree. Because otherwise I, would, I don't would... see any way forward no, if we're I not spreading the word young, because it's 
try try negotiating with adults successfully. Well, that's why I'm forming the cult that I'm forming. And it begins here tonight, and eventually it will be a full-blown dictatorship. But will All you allow me to join, sir, or I'm going you to will be in charge of, would say. You will be in charge of torture and interrogation. <laughs> You will be my greatest Thank weapon. Thank you, sir. You will be my greatest <laughs> weapon. Thank you. I you will be talked to until your head bursts. You must, you <laughs> must think I like my arm up like this. I have to give this one a go to sleep. I thought you were Alan. just doing yoga after a bit. Um, well, I might do, yes. We're, we're nearly at the end of the session. Are there any more uh, questions that people have? Um, if, if you need to leave because you're catching trains, of course, just feel free to, to bolt. But we'll, we'll end with a couple, couple of questions and... Anything else? Yes, madame? Can I ask a question on behalf of you? Maybe you don't want to ask anything. <laughs> I'm just going to ask it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> what if you are with a narcissist? Oh, you've had a relationship with a narcissist and you have a child, so you can never actually cut off 100%. Yeah. Oh, just, get, just buy a gun. Um, <laughs> don't get that on camera. <laughs> don't, 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 don't do that. <laughs> yeah. There's no 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 weapon, no body. Um, so um, it, it, the co, what is it called? Counterparenting with with a narcissist. You're going to have a hard time. Uh, I have a close uh, family member who's going through this now, and we are conversing regularly because um, the hope that you would have uh, for a father of your child is that he's going to be a good father and he will probably tempt you with the idea from time to time that he is going to be, and then he's going to disappoint you, and then you'll be on the roller coaster. Just kill all the hope. Kill all the hope. Um, <coughs> and expect him to be useless and selfish, um, and he won't disappoint you then. <laughs> and then you, you've really got to, you've got to be at a black belt level of emotional regulation. You can't respond to any provocation which he'll give you, I mean, I wouldn't say in the, under these circumstances that usually I would say any and all opportunity to abuse he will take. But possibly if he finds a new source of narcissistic supply, he won't. So you are constantly negotiating. You ever seen like uh, snake handlers put on massive rubber gloves that the snake can't bite through? Never show up with your guard down. That is a dangerous human being. He has the power to really, really hurt you. He's hurt you before. Never forget that. The PTSD will affect your memory and you'll forget and you'll think, oh, he's not that bad. He's all right. He could be a good dad. He's as bad as he was on his worst day. So, you know, when you say, of course, obviously secondary, thirdary and stuff like that, if he's not getting supply off me, mm. and obviously now we're going to go into, and I don't want to go into the big, but now the supply may be going to the little one. Mm. She's only young, so how do I sort of obviously not go in with my guard down, but then how do I protect her without me? Do you know how to control? And well, um, she's going to face narcissistic and abusive personality types throughout her life anyway. Um, so you can teach her what you believe to be true, which is probably something along the lines that um, some people are sick. Um, your daddy is a little bit sick. Sometimes some of the things that he says, he doesn't really know what he's saying. And when you're with him, you should do what he says because he's trying to keep you safe, but you don't have to listen to him all the time. So do as he says, but don't listen to all the messages he gives you because That's what I'm trying to pull across yeah, he gets confused. Yeah. So if he says, I don't know, you're ugly or you're stupid or you're not worth anything, that's one of those moments where he's confused and you don't listen to that. But if he tells you don't run across the road, then don't run across the road. Is she quite young? A lot of it will go out off her, wash off her do she's dog's so back. She's clever though, she's yeah. so... One, once she gets to six or seven, that's, seven. that's where she'll be more susceptible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just, I, I think just on that point, mm. have strategies in place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Go with those strategies and you won't be dysregulated by them. Yeah. Have you got one that's that knows about NPD? Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. See you, mate. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Um, yeah. Um, God, there's so much food for thought. Uh, I have um, 
an absolute uh, starting point with mm. anybody is to set a minimum boundary. And if they don't listen, they're probably a narc and work that way. And those who listen, you know, so I'll have a cup of tea, they'll give me a cup of coffee. I'll be, oh. And I start looking for these red flags. And I, um, my goddaughter was brought up by a chronic narc. I didn't know that at the time. But one of the things I constantly encouraged her was to set boundaries and to, um, you know, validate herself. Mm. And that meant that, I mean, she's amazing now. She's 33 and she's really tough. But that meant that she became impregnable to these narcs. And when they circle her, she just looks at them a bit bewildered and moves on. Um, and I think there is some, um, that, that's what I sort of call my kryptonite, is mm. having these boundaries and then listening to the answer. Mm. And if I say the sky is blue and they turn around and say, you bloody idiot, it's not, mm. I go grey rock or I walk away or whatever it is. And this can be difficult when it's a partner or an ex-partner. Mm. But that to me is one of the most powerful things I've learned is setting boundaries. And children are never too small to respect. Yeah. If they say they don't want to eat grapes, mm -hmm. then you suggest they eat something else. But that, to me, is, is just um, unbelievable. And watching my goddaughter deal with unbelievable abuse from her dad. Mm. I also was a foster parent for a while, and one of their belief systems, again, these kids, just how they survive, um, is that the child should always access the abusive parent, usually in prison, at least once a year, so that they start to see what is normal interaction and what is bonkers <laughs> or what we call narcissistic <laughs> and i've seen that's a, that's a good term for it you've got bonkers bonkers disorder but for me it takes away the the, the danger because it's yeah. like oh mustn't touch that it's dangerous and you just go and i find most narcs actually are quite easy to push over and you've said that again and again in your speech I'm yeah like, because yeah. They're, they're vain and fragile yeah. impressionable I little children and you haven't smell. asked me a question and they smell yeah, uh, last you question. Mean to um, me. Just to go back to splitting, um, I see it as an emotional flashback. So how would someone reduce the episodes of splitting? I know emotional literacy is is helpful, and you said about um, acceptance, not, not being a victim, but are there other tools that someone could put in place? Yeah, I have, I have the uh, stop emotional flashback mnemonic. That helps. Um, to, are you aware of that one? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you think that you're splitting more in a flashback? Oh, no, it's my partner. Um, oh. When we get close, he splits. And it's only something I've really understood recently. I know it's a BPTS, yeah. BPD thing, but I think it's a CPTSD thing. It's a trauma it's, thing. It's so a trauma he'll, thing. he'll literally see me like I'm demonic. But then um, when we move apart... Go to, ther go to therapy together. Oh, yeah, we have been. Yeah. For, that, for that specific issue? Uh, it, it's been a long road, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, I don't know if you you could suggest sort of certain. You should see a therapist. <laughs> you should definitely go and sit with another adult and have that conversation with another adult in the room and just be like, okay, this is this is the thing that's happening, and see see what he says, and then let a therapist who knows what they're doing mediate yeah. that. Yeah, we, um, we've got a really good therapist. She, um, I can't remember the the mode she does like. EFT, but emotionally focused therapy. So it's about being here and now and how okay. I'm feeling. Oh, that's awesome. But, yeah. Awesome. Okay, folks, that's it. Thank you very much for coming and um, safe journeys back home. Thank you. <laughs>